Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Catholic Culture Podcast. I'm Thomas Miras. Uh, I just want to say right off the bat that today's episode deals with the visual arts, so I would recommend that instead of listening to this one, you go and watch it on our YouTube channel. I will link to the YouTube uh, video in the description for the podcast episode so that you can see the, the paintings that we're discussing, because I'll be overlaying them uh, over the video as I did last time Uh, I did an episode about painting. And my guest today uh, has been very generous uh, with her time uh, with the podcast in the past. So I'm I'm pleased to be able to uh, discuss her latest book because the last time we weren't even really plugging uh, one of her writings. So it was especially generous for her to spend so much time. Uh, The art historian Elizabeth Lev is an art tour guide in Rome. She teaches art history at Duquesne University's Rome campus, and she's the author of a couple of books, the latest one being The Silent Night, A History of St. Joseph as Depicted in Art, out from Sophia Institute Press. Welcome to the show, Elizabeth. Thanks for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. It's very generous to have you have me on to talk about this book. Um, well, okay. So, uh, our last discussion on this podcast, um, we've, we've, you've been on two of our podcasts. The other one we discussed, uh, Ben Hur a while back on our film podcast, but on the Catholic culture podcast, the last, uh, time you were on, we talked about the history of, uh, depictions of St. Anthony and particularly the temptation of St. Anthony, uh, St. Anthony Abbott throughout art, art history. And we were pretty extensive in our survey. Um, And now you've written a book which does a similar thing uh, for depictions of St. Joseph. So that sort of raises the question, how many saints do you think you could actually do that with? (laughs) I think think there are actually quite a few. It's a really great question. As a matter of fact, I was writing the book while we were doing that St. Anthony podcast, and I was thinking, wow, there's also St. Anthony, and of course there's Mary Magdalene. Can you imagine? You can write you can write multiple volumes of the way that Mary For Magdalene's sure. been depicted. St. Jerome, obviously, Saint has Jerome, been a standard figure. He's got figure. a whole weird costume change that takes place in the course of the 16th century. Um, St. Francis of Assisi, although his, his well, no, he changes somewhat dramatically. Sometimes he's, you know, much more active. Sometimes he's more contemplative. I think really um, some of the saints really stay with us in, in they 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 are either driven by this kind of constant change in iconography or the richness of their spirituality allows artists mm-hmm. to 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 represent them in myriad ways john the baptist oh yeah um you could do a whole book on angels yes. just on angels I think people have do done art. that would be quite angels. interesting yeah Okay, well, uh, I tremendously enjoyed this new book. Uh, You sort of get two histories for the price of one because you're getting a history of uh, Josephine iconography, but also along with that goes a history of um, devotion and theology about St. Joseph in the church uh, and its development over the past 20 centuries. Um, So that's very fascinating and, and edifying as well. Um, but I, I wanted to, uh, and, and of course, many, many beautiful pictures in the book. Um, I wanted to ask, though, uh, about a comment you made at the beginning of the book, which is that St. Joseph uh, resonates in a particular way with visual artists. Now, why might that be? Well, I think the fact that Joseph has you know, not one word recorded in the Gospels, he has 15 mentions in the Gospels, he, uh, in a certain sense, is kind of like putty, right? Because we, there's nothing to really define him or fit him into a particular mold. We don't have this kind of constraint of he did this, he did that. We just have this, we don't have his own voice. And that allows him to be something where artists can leave their imprint on him, depending on what they want to reflect of this sort of fascinating and in many ways enigmatic character. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, but, but, he wasn't always the most popular choice uh, for for artists in the very early centuries of Christian art. You might even have nativity scenes where he's he's left out of the picture or just a very, very minor figure. So uh, I know that uh, we want to get to uh, mainly the parts where he was, you know, given uh, a serious attention on the canvas. But uh, maybe we can start out with why some, what some of the reasons are why he wouldn't have been focused on. Why did it take so long for de- 
devotion to St. Joseph to develop in this way? That's a very good question. I mean, the, the fact is that the Christians are a little hesitant about the whole art thing to begin with. So you know, Christianity doesn't actually start producing art until late second century, beginning of the third century. And even then, it's a very kind of limited field of things they want to show because it's so hand in hand with doctrine and evangelization. So they, when they, the, the images of Christ that they show tend to focus on either the incarnation or his ministry for the most part. And when it comes to images like the nativity, the most important element that the early Christian community must communicate through art is the divine paternity of Christ. They have to right. make the point that Jesus is God, is the son of God. And the other thing they care a great deal about, of course, by, 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 by extension, is the virginity of Mary. And so these two elements, which are paramount, are such such that to introduce the character of Joseph would cause confusion among these first converts, these people who are approaching uh, the Christian religion. And so Joseph, a gentleman, steps off to the side until the time is right for him to enter into the picture. Yeah, it reminded me of a sermon by St. John Henry Newman. I think it's called uh, The Glories of Mary for the Sake of Her Son, where he talks about the the gradual development of devotion to Mary and uh, articulation of Marian uh, dogma. And uh, he basically says that, you know, she's stepping in the back to allow people to focus on Jesus. And she only makes herself more known uh, to the church when it becomes necessary for the sake of her son's glory, when it becomes necessary for, you know, her son's full humanity and full divinity to be defended. And then later on uh, with more, more developments in, in more recent centuries, but it's a similar idea, I guess, mm -hmm. with, with St. Joseph. Even more so, um, I think with St. Joseph. Maybe we can take a look at some of the, the earlier depictions of St. Joseph in your book. You mention. um, uh, the St. Mary Major mosaics from the 5th century, and then the throne of Maximinian as two important uh, early examples where we get St. Joseph in art. Yes, those two are really the debut of Joseph in art. We don't have any Joseph in art until St. Mary Major and the throne of Maximinian, which is right about the same period. So we're talking about the mid-5th century. The throne of Maximinian is an ivory Episcopal throne, which was in Ravenna, which was at the time the capital of the Roman Empire, whereas St. Mary Major, of course, is the oldest Marian church in the West, built on the top of the Esquiline Hill in Rome, while no longer de facto the uh, the capital of Rome still holds the prestige of being well Rome. And so in the case of Mary Major, we have the triumphal arch. So directly above the altar, there are these extraordinarily beautiful mosaics in a program that may have been designed by the successive pope. So the pope who paid for St. Mary Major was Sixtus III, but his right-hand man was the future Leo the Great, who we know makes mm. gives several, several sermons on the Epiphany and the Holy Family. And so the... Um, the images uh, for the very first time, Joseph appears in art, but not sort of coyly or shyly peeking into the corner. He's five times in the triumphal arch of St. Mary Major. And, and as a matter of fact, to the point where he actually appears more than Mary and more than Jesus. So he makes a wow. really dazzling debut uh, in art. Meanwhile, up in Ravenna in this Episcopal throne, there are a series of carved ivory panels which emphasize so many uh, apocryphal stories of Joseph. It's not just a question of Joseph sitting in the corner of the nativity or Joseph sitting around watching the three wise men arrive, but images where you see Joseph leading a pregnant Mary to Bethlehem on her donk on this donkey. So we see him being solicitous and caring of her. And then another one, which comes from again, apocrypha, where uh, when Mary is found to be pregnant, Joseph and Mary are accused of unchastity. And so they have to drink this bitter water, this poisoned water in order to prove that they have been chased. And you see Joseph was kind of helping Mary to drink this water. So it's, he, you know, he, he comes out in this, in this fifth century in a very, um, this, 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 this wonderfully active, solicitous, uh, you can sort of see all the future Josephs in these images. Hmm. 
Um, and and not too long after that, I mean, we 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 get this development of a sort of a standard posture for Saint Joseph. Um, he's he's often sitting, sort of sitting to the side of a nativity scene. Um, sometimes facing away, sometimes facing towards it, but um, he's kind of pensive. You describe him as even being gloomy in some depictions. Um, I, I think there was another writer, maybe um, one of the saints, medieval saints you mentioned later, who, who complained about him looking gloomy and depressed in some depictions. Um, and uh, there, there's this sort of standard thing for a while um, that uh, emerges, for example, in this... Um, and this Mount Sinai icon from the seventh century. <laughs> I love that icon. Um, the uh, it's it's a popular icon. So it's it's a work of um, it's a work that was meant to be circulated. Is what I mean by popular. So when we're talking about the Episcopal throne in Ravenna or the triumphal arch of Saint Mary Major, we're talking about extremely elite um, spaces. And you know, mm -hmm. probably seen by a fairly, it's people who could see it regularly or up close are people who have a very, fairly elite group. Um, whereas these icons are things that would have been you know, much more in the hands of everyday regular people. And with that, we revert to the problem of emphasizing to the faithful who are looking at these images and taking their knowledge of, of Christianity from these images. The, the ancient, he's a very old man and he's turned away, as you said, and he looks kind of gloomy and grumpy. And so the very old man, again, is a way of protecting the virginity of Mary, sort of assumption that uh, connected to the apocryphal stories um, of uh, the 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 infancy uh, narratives of Christ or pseudo Matthew or the proto evangelium of James, um, these narratives talk about a Joseph who was a very old man who had already had two adult children. So we see a man who's supposed to be kind of you know, at the end of his life, not looking to you know not 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 feeling amorous towards a young girl. Basically, the idea is to remove the idea of of, of a Joseph who's spurred by physical desire. Um, secondly, we see Joseph turned away so that we do not connect him with the Christ child to again allude to the divine paternity. He is not biologically connected to the child. He just happens to be there. As a matter of fact, in that icon, what I find sort of sadly adorable about it is that while everybody else is busy doing something around the nativity, we have Joseph who looks like he's just tending the camels over in the corner. Like he's there to watch mm -hmm. the wise men's camels. And then the third thing is, um, you see him sort of wrapped up in his inside his uh, his robe, kind of a cocoon. Again, no way is his physicality emphasized, which is the exact opposite of what they do in the uh, Saint Mary Major mosaics. And then finally, this troubled Joseph, this gloomy Joseph, appears to allude to Joseph, who feels, if you will, the weight of the world on his shoulders. He's a regular mm -hmm. guy who's being asked to be the foster father of, of God. And so what am I supposed to do? And, and again, this apocryphal, we, the apocryphals, we hear about Joseph, who's worried that people are going to laugh at him because he's marrying such a young girl. And what am I going to do? And how am I going to handle this? And how am I going to explain this pregnancy? So Joseph always seems to be um, uh, in these particular images, carrying the kind of concerns and things that, that, that worry normal people um, insofar as like, what are other people going to think of me? Hmm. Yeah. My favorite example of this particular um, posture of a sort of a sad looking Joseph is the, the one, the, the fragment that is uh, in the Pushkin museum. And I think this is from uh, a mosaic that was originally in St. Peter's. It was part of the oratory of St. Peter. So this is the old St. Peter's, the Constantinian St. Peter's. And between 705 and 707, Pope John VII had a special oratory or chapel built in there dedicated to Mary. He was used to sign himself John, servant of Mary. And um, the uh, and, and this was a series of mosaics, including things like the Nativity and the um, the, the adoration of the Magi. Those mosaics were um, destroyed or the, the chapel was destroyed in order to make way for the new St. Peter's and fragments of the mosaics were recouped and sent to different piece, places and that, that St. Joseph one ended up in the Pushkin Museum. Great. So at a certain point, we're getting into the Middle Ages here. 
Um, who were some of the saints who advanced devotion to St. Joseph in the Middle Ages? So there's a tremendous jumpstart for Joseph in the Middle Ages, and I would say spearheaded by um, Bernard of Clairvaux. And uh, mm. this moment of reform in the church, there's a rather moment, there's a moment of rather intense reform. It's already beginning before Bernard of Clairvaux. We see this uh, work in Cluny, which is seeing this this really transformation, reawakening of the church, its beliefs, its, 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 its way of life. And then, of course, the Cistercians, um, in which Bernardo Clairvaux will probably be its greatest exponent, which, again, is continuing to encourage the process of reform. And uh, it is Bernard of Clairvaux who preaches on Joseph, husband of Mary, and really brings forth a Joseph... Uh, who is not a Joseph of the Apocryphals, but a Joseph, he draws from the Joseph of Scripture, comparing him to his namesake, Joseph the Patriarch, and sort of creates mm. a very dignified and almost regal Joseph that will begin uh, to allow artists to look at Joseph differently. Uh, now, uh, St. Bernard, obviously one of the great Marian saints as well, and I'm curious uh, if in your research you found that, I mean, obviously every Catholic saint is going to be devoted to Mary, but um, did you find that saints that were particularly Marian were likely to have a special devotion to St. Joseph as well? I think for the most part, by and large, yes. So Bernardino of Siena, for example, as well. Um, but then there are saints who really just, it, it, not that they are, are devoted to Mary, but that Joseph really, in the case of Teresa of Avila, Joseph really uh, becomes a, a beacon for her. So it, it really kind of mm. depended, um, depending on, it, it, it depended. In the beginning, we see more of um, a, 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 the reflection on Joseph as an offshoot of a reflection on Mary. And then as the centuries progress, Joseph begins to be a standalone um uh, devotion. I see. I see. So, um, yeah, let's look at this Gisla Bertus, uh, flight into Egypt here. Very, mm -hmm. very interesting portrayal. I, I would have to say it's, it's certainly the first of its kind that you show in the book. I don't know if there's anything, any precedents for it, uh, earlier in art history. I did not find a precedent. I, I, I love that. Um, I think if I were to go and, uh, search all the Romanesque capitals and all the Roman Romanesque churches in, um, in France, I would probably end up finding another one. Um, it sound, looks to me mm -hmm. like something that would have, um, it looks to me like something that would have had, if you will, a certain, certain iconographic success in that kind of imagery. So what we're talking about, just to be clear, is in the Cathedral of Saint-Lazare in Auton, which is in Burgundy in France, uh, you have a series, that whole area is filled with these exceptionally beautiful churches built in the Romanesque era. So that would be the 11th, 12th century. And um, this is, uh, this is again, the same area, the same exact area as where you have a Cluny is in Burgundy and the Cistercians are formed in the, in the, in the Abbey of, of Fontenay in, in Burgundy. So this is, this is the ground zero of the church revival. They start building these churches that have have a, have a lot of carving. The Romanesque means that there's a lot of stone in these buildings. And so yeah. uh, they, there's a lot of stone work and therefore for decoration, they use a lot of carving. And Gilbertus, who works in the Cathedral of Aton, he decorates the capitals of the columns. So all the capitals, all the arches, but most surprisingly, the capitals. If any of your listeners ever took art history, you, they're, they're thinking, oh, capitals, Ionic, Doric, Corinthian, composite, Tuscan. There's a very sort of very simple five types of capitals. But in right. Romanesque art, these become spaces. The spaces on the top of the columns become places where they try to show narratives. And this incredibly beautiful, wonderful piece of sculpture has Mary holding Jesus sitting on a donkey. And then Joseph is leading the donkey around the corner of the Capitol. And he's wearing a little knight's outfit. He's dressed up yeah. as a knight, which is, of course, the moment I was like, oh, I know what I'm going to call the book. So he's dressed 
dressed up as this knight and he's holding his sword and you see him as this this wonderful reflection of a world of you know you have the you have the abbots you have the knights and this is the society right so you have this 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 group of people who will be joining religious orders and these the men who become abbots are usually scions of incredibly important families whereas the oldest scion becomes a knight is meant to bring honor to the family by caring for the family and bringing on the family dynasty and so these two this kind of this this world which is a feudal world as much as we may not approve of a feudal world it is what it is this feudal world begins to contemplate saint joseph as a nobleman they start talking about his genealogy that he's descended from kings joseph is a regal man, says Bernard of Clairvaux. He is he is like 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 Joseph the patriarch. He is accustomed to the company of kings. He's, he's of a line of kings, and Joseph is accustomed to the company of kings. And the two of them also share this 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 powerful form of communication through contemplation. So where Joseph is given, Joseph the patriarch is given the capacity of interpreting dreams, Joseph the foster father of Christ has an even greater ability of, of understanding through dreams. How does he interpret divine will because he's given a privileged form of communication. Now for men like Bernard of Clairvaux who are famous for these beautiful visions, Joseph is the antecedent of this. Joseph is the antecedent hmm. of the contemplative life where you have this privileged way of communicating with the Lord. So the, the beautiful way that this gets uh, explored in the art and the spirituality of the age. And here we start getting into a younger and more virile uh, Joseph as well, right? They're more comfortable. So the other, so of course, the, the so Bernard, Bernard Clairvaux talks about uh, the regality. He talks about this as a contemplative, this communication through this angelic communication. And the third thing he talks about is self mastery. And so the Joseph of Bernard of Clairvaux, like Joseph the Patriarch, Joseph the Patriarch, he, 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 he refuses, he rejects the advances of Potiphar's wife, and Joseph, the, the foster father of Christ, lives chastely with Mary because he chooses to, not because he's so right. old he can't do anything else, but because he is a man of self-mastery. And that is a turning point at the new millennium, which allows us to start thinking of Joseph in a million different ways. And that's right. where the, 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 the art begins to accumulate very rapid fire from this moment on. Yeah. So, and, and this makes him into a figure who's more, I mean, uh, even more analogous to Mary in his sort of his choice as a young man to undertake this duty. Exactly. Exactly. This is, this is a man who chooses and they begin and also, and, and, and you'll see later on, um, they begin to converge in their, in their, in their mission. They begin to, right. they, you, you see them much more as a kind of a complementary pair, a husband and wife who are working together in this project of salvation. Uh, you were just talking about sleeping St. Joseph, so you'll uh, St. Joseph dreams. Let's let's take a quick look at a couple of these. Um, I wanted to look at the um, uh, first at the the Chartres Cathedral uh, stained glass panel, which is really beautiful in its colors. It is. It, it's a it's a stunningly beautiful panel. Those the famous blue of Chartres. Uh, that's sort of the the great recipe for that deep blue, and in it. Um, we see that so the one the, the the icon we were talking about before in Sinai we saw Joseph kind of relegated over to the lower left hand side kind of left in the corner. In Chartres we begin to see Joseph now paired with Mary. So even the sense of the complementarity between their roles, Joseph is sleeping, Mary is awake, but you have them both converging towards the Christ child who's in the, in the crib in his swaddling clothes. And interestingly, a little bit of both of their colors uh, seems to be intermixed into the, into the, into the, where the Christ child is. So it's a, it seems to me right. that they're working towards this idea of, of what you were just saying before about Mary and Joseph having these kinds of complementary similarities. 
Yeah, well, and it's also interesting how this dreaming thing uh, kind of in itself unites the contemplative and the active, because you could say in this picture, uh, Mary is contemplating the sleeping Jesus. And, and of course, Joseph sleeping and dreaming and having visions, that's that is contemplative, but he is receiving instructions, you know, yes. for the for the next the next action as well. And that's what we see in this um, much later piece. Um, this is a cross from Bernini's famous uh, sculpture of St. Teresa in ecstasy. And this is uh, Domenico Guidi's dream of Joseph done in a similar style. You, you wouldn't, you would, nobody ever notices it. It's, it's got a tragic position of being across from the, <laughs> I mean, Bernini, Brenda Bernini's like the, the arguably in the top three of Bernini's best works. And then there's poor Domenico Nudi on the other side, like, hey, maybe you could give me like Joseph's like speaking to the angel, right? And so he tries, it's got the same type of um, architectural setting, which is uh, there's a recessed space like a theater, and then the sculptures are to be placed inside that space. But with Bernini, you have the floating Teresa, they're sitting on the cloud. And Domenico Guidi, just not to be copying so obviously, it also because what Teresa, what is Teresa is experiencing is, is an ecstatic vision, well as well as whereas Joseph, it, it's meant to sort of ground him more as someone who's um, sleeping and he's going to get up and he's going to act because he's being told right. something he's supposed to do. And so it has this kind of strange cloud that looks up. It looks a little bit like a marshmallow gone seriously wrong. And then you've got Joseph sort of reclining and the angel who comes down to awaken him. But it is interesting that again, having started with this discussion of contemplative with St. Bernard, um, Ter Teresa of Avila, who is contemplation, all extraordinary contemplative, um, the, the two works are across from each other. So it really makes it much more obvious the idea of Joseph's role or Joseph's appeal to contemplative saints. Right, right, right. Yeah. And so um, there's also this, uh, speaking of contemplation, there's also this Fra Angelico uh, diptych that portrays St. Joseph in, uh, in a contemplative role. I, I, those those are works that I think the beautiful. It's a little predella piece, and he does a ton of them. By the way, I was just looking at another one in the Vatican yeah, I've seen a yesterday of them. morning. Second guessing myself, should I use this one? Should I use that one? But what again? It's again this question of the 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 pairing of Mary and Jesus. It becomes a, a, a greater sense of. Uh, bringing Joseph now closer and closer and more um, more participatory in the witness as more participatory as witness to the incarnation. And in the case of Frangelico, who is Dominican, i.e. the order of preachers, the role of Joseph becomes interesting in that in several of these works, you see Joseph kind of placed a little bit closer towards the viewer. He's kind of a go-between between the 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 Christ child and and the viewer sometimes he's 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 placed he's, he's kind of he, he grows a little bit more actively um uh involved in the contemplation of the Christ child and then the implication is that he helps us as regular human beings to enter into this mystery because he becomes our go-between and where does this this posture of the two uh, Mary and Joseph kneeling on the other side of the Christ Child? Oh, and wonderful! Where wonderful, does that originate? Wonderful. This is a very embarrassing story because I don't know how many times I've been to the Vatican museums. I don't think I want to know. But um, turns out that the oldest version of this image is in the Vatican museums, much to my incredible mm. shame. I did not figure that out until this year. This is from the vision of Saint Bridget of Sweden, who goes to. Bethlehem, and she uh, has a she has a she has a visionary experience in the cave in Bethlehem, in which she sees the nativity taking place. And her her vision: Mary and Joseph come in. Mary kneels down. Joseph leaves the room, and as Mary is praying, this tremendous light suffuses her, and the Christ child appears on the ground, emanating light. Mary continues to kneel. Joseph comes in and kneels next to her, and the two of them sit in quiet adoration of the child. So that image that you have seen, we've seen a million gazillion times of the right. two 
kneeling side by side before, two kneeling, sorry, not side by side, but kneeling on opposite sides of the Christ child, that is from, that, that the iconography was born from the vision of St. Bridget and has been basically used, been used over and over and over again. Right. And it turns out the oldest version of it is in the oldest version, the one that is the closest to when she first revealed this vision is in the Vatican Museums. Yeah, the influence of of spiritual developments and of uh, church developments in doctrine, um, the situation of the church on the developing iconography of Joseph is is really brought out in this book. You have a whole chapter on Saint Joseph as a comic figure. Now, I, I admit, uh, like uh, Saint Bernardino, I have my reservations about some of these. <laughs> now you make me feel like it's like a horrible person. I'm, first of all, I'm, I'm very susceptible to comedy, so there it is. Um, but um, there is a genre that appears in the 1400s in Northern, in Northern Europe. And the, um, the genre- I'm not surprised. <laughs> they, 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 they're good at the grotesque. They are. I have to say. Yeah, these, these are the people who are going to come up with some pretty funny things during the Reformation too. Um, the, um, they, uh, they produce a, uh, a series of images in which Joseph appears to be a kind of comic relief figure. What they are based on is um, the part of the apocryphal stories where Joseph occasionally seems to be a little bumbling. So even in the apocryphals, in these, in these ancient stories, Joseph appears to be a little bit not with the program. So first of all, he's nervous because he's bringing, he's got Mary, he's going to get married to Mary. And then um, when he brings Mary to the cave, he runs off to get midwives. He's trying to find midwives, but he can't find any midwives. And then he brings them, it's mm. too late, the baby's already born. And so they begin to sort of create this, this, this funny, uh, not not Inspector Clouseau type figure, but someone who just seems to be like totally caught up in 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 things of things of of this world. And um, more to the point, there is a secondary um, impetus to this new kind of iconography, and that secondary impetus has to do with the discovery of an icon. So basically, uh, sorry, a discovery of a relic. So Joseph, up until eleven hundred, does not have an does not have a doesn't have a relic and relics help to kind of cement our um, devotion to saints and so the fact is that they discover or the the, the relic of joseph it's his hosen, like Joseph socks. I mean, come on. It's like the best relic ever. So they, 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 it's in the Marian shrine in Aachen and they, uh, they, they find Joseph's hosen, which, uh, according to again, legend, um, Joseph, when Jesus was born, the cold night in January in, in, in Bethlehem, Joseph took off his hosen and he cut it up in order to give Jesus swaddling clothes. And so hmm. it's a way of kind of, um, uh, it laughs at Joseph, but at the same time exalts his humble and yet, yet essential gift. And I think that's a really important part of the, I think it's a really important part of why these works are important. I think these works are very important because they allow us to enter into this tremendous mystery. The mystery of the incarnation of the nativity is enormous. And, you know, Mary, well, you know, she's Mary and, and Jesus, well, he's God. And to have this kind of Joseph who's, you know, oh, what can I do? What can I give? What, what, what I but what can I offer? Oh, I'll tell you what, I, I, I've got socks. I could probably help you out with those. What, what a beautiful thing. And they're mm -hmm. often paired with the arrival of the Magi. So the Magi show up with all their fabulous gifts. But the first necessity, the man who took the clothes off his own body for Jesus. I think, it, I think yes, we, we laugh a little, but I think it makes us respect him. It's really an invitation to respect him all the more. Yeah, fair enough. I like this uh, this nativity scene by an unknown artist, which shows this shows this scene directly, where uh, we have Joseph sitting in the corner um, with his leg outstretched, and he's sort of taking apart his his socks. Uh, for I, the I baby. love it. I really, I love it. I love it. Yeah. 
Um, and then we've got some that are a little further from that particular story, like the Conrad von Sost uh, nativity, where we have Joseph uh, leaning over, uh, really bending on all fours over over a fire to uh, make some food here, um, which is a more more overtly comic image. It, it is. It is. It, it's a very, it seems overtly comic because they put him in this ridiculous position, right? He's like curled up like a little ball. But on the other hand, um, when you look at donor images in mosaics, so for, for example, if you're looking at um, um, a mosaic in an apse where you see the Pope, um, let's take St. Paul's outside the walls, um, you'll often see the Pope kind of curled up like a little or, or the bronze doors of St. Paul's outside the walls. Um, this, you'll see the donor image kind of curled up in this kind of prostrate mode. So it, it, in many ways, it, it is just this, that, that, that humility of Joseph, that abject humility and, and almost you know, a willingness to, to, to do anything for his son. And the other thing that's interesting about the work is that his colors pick up Mary's colors. So he's wearing kind of a startlingly yellow outfit and he's got yellow and blue and then Mary's got yellow and blue. So as Mary sits there and holds her son and contemplates her son, Joseph is busy with the mechanics of getting dinner ready, right? And so he's, um, this is connected to this idea of Joseph nutrior domini, the, 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 the man who feeds the Lord and the, the nourisher of the Lord. It's, it is interesting that even though it does it in kind of a, um, a comic or, 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 or kind of silly vein. Um, I think the point they're trying to get across is very, is much more respectful, is much more um, uh, uh, intended to include us lay people in how in our own daily lives, we can be part of this project of salvation. I see. Um, so at this this time, it's interesting because we we start to get saints who are directly commenting on artistic portrayals of Saint Joseph. So maybe you can talk a little bit bit about Saint Bernardino of Siena and his his commentary and his recommendations to artists. Ah, yes, Bernardino of Siena does not like grumpy Joseph. Does not like disrespectful Joseph. He says, first of all. There's, and he, he, he like uh, Bernard of Clairvaux, but he, in particular, Bernardino of Siena, talks about the man who held Jesus. So this guy gets to hold Jesus, cuddle Jesus, smell his hair. What, he's going to be unhappy? What kind of guy? How can you possibly uh -huh. think this man was anything but filled with joy? If John the Baptist was filled with joy just being in the proximity in the womb, imagine what it's like for, jo for Joseph, who actually every day gets to wake up and tossle Jesus's hair and put him on his knee and, and show him things and teach him things. It was just, so, so that's, that, that's, that's, I think a very important part of uh, turning uh, the iconography of Joseph in the direction of something that is more active, joyous, happily participatory. Mm. Yeah, well, that's it's interesting. I, um, you know, I don't know how many how many. Um, I'm sure that uh, when when you get to popes of a certain point, you get them making. I mean, the Council of Trent, for example, gave a, a particular impetus to religious art. But it's just interesting to see saints explicitly commenting, not only sort of indirectly influencing art by their commentary on the subject matter, but also commenting on works of art themselves and sort of approving or disapproving of different trends in so, personal art. You're right. Bernardino of Siena has a particular dislike of those comic. He'd seen those comic images and he does not like mm -hmm. them at all. So he doesn't like Joseph as an old man and he doesn't want you making fun of Joseph. I think, I think mm -hmm. ironically, I think this is a funny little irony. I think the only reason why you can have those comic images and those comic images show up in the 1400s, the only reason why you can have them is because of the Franciscans, because the Franciscans put such an emphasis on the humanity of Christ and that, that Joseph mm. becomes the witness to the humanity of Christ. Joseph's job, Mary's there, you know, connected to the divinity of Christ and Joseph is there to deal with the humanity of Christ and Joseph is there. And the, one of the ways that in the Northern countries they 
do it is to do it is to make it look very mundane and simple and almost goofy. Whereas the Franciscans have a different way of doing it. Sorry, the Franciscans in, in central Italy have a more dignified way of doing it where you will see Joseph who will usually be supervising Jesus's bath or watching over. He's, he's much more of a kind of, um, uh, he's almost like the bishop presiding over things that are happening as opposed to being a first person active participant, which you have up in the north. But nonetheless, I think these are two sides of the same coin. So that it actually is the, the, the revolution brought about by the Franciscans, which Bernardino Siena is a very important exponent, that creates the... Um, the the foundations to be to be to 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 form the more comic image of joseph if that mm. makes any sense at all yeah 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 so uh there's so many different you know aspects of saint joseph that you cover in this book and we can't hit them all um we're, we're going to get joseph being a more and more dignified figure both in his sort of lordly aspect and also in his his spousal and fatherly aspect. Um, and in, in both of those respects, uh, I don't think we'll focus on this, but it's worth mentioning that there's an increasing identification of Joseph with the Pope or Joseph with St. Peter to the point that Joseph is often depicted for a period of time wearing the paper, papal colors. And that's something that comes up even in, in, uh, you know, even in depictions that are not, uh, totally focused on that aspect of him. Sometimes you still see him wearing the papal colors as part of that tradition, which is very interesting. I'd, I'd never heard of that before. Again, reasons why I just realized, wait a minute, this needs to be a book. How many costume changes does this guy get? And it's really, it's again, it comes out of a moment of crisis in the church regarding the papacy. And uh, we again, we have figures who are not canonized saints, but they are enormous figures uh, for the spirituality of the age who start saying, you know, the church really is looking for what, what the church needs is to be husbanded the way that Joseph was husband to Mary. So I wanted to look um, at this marriage of the Virgin by Nicholas Poussin, uh, one of my favorite uh, pieces in this book. And this is one where we really, um, there are a number from the Renaissance that are like this, but uh, this is one where we really see them as, um, as a pair, as a, um, uh, as counterparts. Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm very glad you liked it because, boy, that was one of the hardest pictures to get. That one, that one was complicated. Um, the, uh, it's in a private collection. It's one of, uh, it's one of a series of paintings of the seven sacraments. It's in Scotland or England. I don't remember any more writing hmm. people who try to get permissions for the image. Um, and, uh, it's occasionally show. I think it's, I think it's a shown, it's sometimes shown in a museum, but I think at the time it was back in this, in this, in this castle and, um, on top of everything else, COVID made everything impossible. So, right. uh, this very, and I, and, and I, I was very, I, I, you know, I kept thinking you can find another image. You can find another image. Why are you so fixated on this image? So I'm, you mm -hmm. made, you just made it all worth it right there. All the <laughs> trouble. Just, what did you, did you, did you have to get rights to use an existing photograph or did you have to get this thing photographed for the book? I was trying to get, I was trying to get a photograph for the book. I was trying to get a direct, a better image that I, I wanted a larger image. I, I thought it was so beautiful and I was trying to get them to give me a larger image image, but they did not do that. But at least they gave me permission to use the, um, the image that I chose. But so, but it just as a side note, I mean, how many of these uh, photos in the book were taken for this book? Uh, let's see. Um, maybe about a third. And I assume these were works that had been photographed, but just not as well as you wanted for your purposes. some some of them some of them it, yes it was there were parts of the 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 obtaining of photographs that was that was fairly that were fairly challenging some were hair raising um uh, some were quite pleasant some were yeah some were mm -hmm. it, it, tremendous rabbit holes of italian bureaucracy <laughs> Interesting. I hadn't even thought about this going it's, into it. it. Uh, it's really it was enough to put me off doing another book with lots and lots and lots of various images for quite some time. Next time, hmm. so maybe just stick with one picture or one museum because I'm not going through that again. It was it was complicated. Hmm. Okay, so let's reason. look at this Poussin. But uh, I really, painting. really, really wanted it. 
And I wanted it because Poussin, of course, was a beautiful artist. So he creates this, he creates the framework. It's so austere. It's so, um, it's austere. And yet it, using that Roman architecture, it conveys that sense of permanence that Roman architecture gives. So you have that something that's solid, even though it is a canopy, it's there, they're sitting inside something that looks like a canopy. So there are four columns and then there's the, there's a something, there's something on roof on top of it. So it does allude to a marriage canopy, but at the same time, it's got a solidity and a permanence to it, which I think is a very beautiful setting. Then you have the group of people that are standing around. You have the, you have the suitors and you have Mary's, I don't know, friends and family on the opposite side. And he stays away, Poussin, he stays away from kind of the stories of the angry suitors. There's, you can see there's a little bit of discussion going on, but in earlier paintings, you always have like a suitor breaking a rod over his knee and looking very angry. Instead, this- So these kind of, are Mary's other suitors. These are Mary's this other suitors. This is from an apocryphal story. And, okay. um, and so this has a, has a dignity to it. But the part that I really, I found so- stunning was the two figures kneeling together underneath within the mantle of the priest. No, so the bishop's mantle comes out and enfolds the two together. And one of the reasons why these images become so important is to really underscore the sacrament of marriage. So marriage is not simply two people who sign a contract, but the presence of the priest that unites them both underneath his mantle it brings in the sacramentality of the presence of the priest here. And then you have the the consent which of course the um the the other reason why they're so interested in these images is because of a debate going on about whether or not consent or consummation is what constitutes marriage and obviously uh, joseph and and mary are the poster children for consent that consent is what makes a marriage right 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 um and this is uh, does Jean Gerson play in, in this uh, into this discussion of consent? I can't remember. Was that was that he, him who was one of the people discussing? He's it? what he plays into is he really wants um, a uh, he really wants he's he's one of the main figures for um, Joseph as Saint Peter, but he really wants to create a feast day for the espousals of the Virgin. So he's really, really, right. really, really, really right, interested right. in the question of um, creating a feast day for Mary and Joseph in their wedding, which moves around all gotcha. over the calendar. I think it ended up in January, then it just disappeared completely. Um, so in the Baroque period, um, we get a lot of uh, depictions of Joseph with Jesus without Mary in the image. Um, is that new to that period? Oh, yes. I mean, there are a few, there's some images in which you can, there's some earlier images in the Renaissance where there's an indication that they're thinking about creating Joseph as a kind of solo figure. So um, there are, there are a few little hints that Joseph, they put Joseph in kind of a funny position. You're doing something a little bit different to kind of indicate that the mindset is thinking about how do we hold Joseph up alone as a, as a saint, but it's really the Baroque that opens up the floodgate as Jerome becomes, as, as, as Joseph becomes a solo figure or, you know, like the Madonna and child, it becomes the Joseph and child. And so that he's not sort of like the third wheel of the Holy family, but he becomes this parent who can be represented alone with the Christ child, or he can also be represented, um, uh, uh, in his workshop with the Christ child. There's a whole mm -hmm. series of images where we start exploring uh, Joseph's personal relationship with Christ. Right. Now, I loved all of the images in this chapter on Baroque portrayals of Joseph. So let me let me just ask you, uh, is there any one that you'd particularly like to discuss here? Well, let's see. Um, there are, there, there, my favorite is the Guido Reni, but that's my favorite. I just, I love the Guido Reni image where he holds the Christ child and baby Jesus is playing with his white fluffy beard. It, it, it's, it's to me a perfect um, amalgamation of all the different ideas of Joseph. Joseph is seen as older and a little wiser. He's wearing the colors of St. Peter. He's derived from an ancient Roman sculpture. And to me, it's just a very, very beautiful. If I wanted one in my house, it'd probably be that one. However, 
um, the one I think that is the most, the one that kind of, that, that, that had me thinking about the opening lines of the book is the Murillo, where you see this, you know, raven haired Joseph with this, you know, Grecianly gorgeous profile gazing off into the distance while holding the golden haired Christ child to his side. I mean, this unbelievably handsome Joseph who looks a lot like Jesus is going to look when Jesus gets older. So the new look Mm. for Joseph is no longer Peter. We've moved right up the food chain so that Joseph becomes uh, uh, Joseph becomes a precursor to what Jesus is going to look like. And this, he's, mm. he's a masculine, handsome uh, uh, d- d- figure with great gravitas who is looking ahead to danger to protect his son. I just, I love that image. Yeah. It's also interesting to see Jesus is holding the, the lily here yes. in this depiction. Yeah. So conferring on his father, you know, the, 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 this, again, the image of his self-mastery. And the background is quite interesting to this image, too. I mean, it is kind of a dark and stormy uh, background uh, for this, you know, a, a scene which is peaceful. Um, I mean, these figures are peaceful, but in the background is sort of desolate. I think that's true. I think it has a lot. I think you're right. And I think um, that juxtaposition of Joseph, who appears to remain calm in a crisis, right? So Joseph is uh, has to take a, a extremely pregnant woman on a trip to Bethlehem um, to go do a census. And then he gets there and the his wife is about to have a baby and has to figure it out. Um, then the baby is born and it turns out the king of the country wants them dead. So he has to go to Egypt. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of crisis in Joseph. Mm. And so Joseph doesn't, it's not like, you know, Joseph just sat around and did nothing and, you know, sat up with his feet up by the pool. Joseph is really dealing with crises almost all the time. And so the fact that he's he's sort of, the dark clouds are brewing because this holy family is not going to have that easy a time of it. Yeah. They're going to misplace Jesus at some point. I mean, it's it's intense. And yet he remains calm in all of these crises. Yeah. Um, So yeah, this period we get another, a lot of glorious images of St. Joseph that we get Christ crowning St. Joseph in heaven. Uh, El Greco's painting is very magnificent. Um, so these are, these are things that also, I think can be precursors to some of the depictions of Joseph as, as patron of the universal church, which we'll get to later in terms of him as a very majestic figure. Um, let's move to some of the domestic depictions of Joseph in the Holy family. Um, in particular, there are a number of really beautiful, uh, images of the rest on the flight to Egypt, but I wanted to focus on the one by, uh, Barocci. Barocci, one of my favorite, favorite artists. Actually, that image, I have a copy of that in my entryway in my house because it's it's so mm. beautiful. And it, again, it alludes to it's a it's a happy take on an apocryphal story where they stop on the way to Egypt. They rest and Mary asks for water. Mary asks for fruit. And in, in the apocryphal story, Joseph is a little grumpy. But Barocci decides right. none of that. It's all mistaken. And instead he gives us this, this glorious moment of peace. And you see Mary kneeling in the foreground. The baby Jesus, he's he's laughing. These sort of sort of pink cheeks, sort of uh, the this sort of apple cheeks, is twinkling. Literally the the painting twinkles. The way that um Barocci uses the brush stroke, it, it gives you the impression of something that's moving, something that's flickering. And Joseph right. is pulling down the the cherries in order to offer them to Christ and to Mary and these little red drops which in the midst of that beautiful quiet tranquil scene these little red these little red drops of cherries in that even that in this moment of peace that you know the ultimate the ultimate sacrifice of Christ. We, we, the, the, the cherries are there to remind us of the drops of blood but in the midst of that we have such a wonderful scene of family and such a peaceful harmonies. It's kind of like the one you were talking about just a second ago, we were talking about the Murillo that yes, you know, they're on, they're escaping from a murderous King and they have no idea what they're going to do. But within that, they managed to find these moments of joy. Yeah. Joseph as, as, as 
basically as jolly as Santa Claus in this. <laughs> he looks a little image. like Santa Claus, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah, it's a really beautiful image. And and, and he's got this, you, you talk about in the book about this, this technique that he used, which makes it almost look like a, a moving image. Yes, it's color canjante is what it's called. It means changing color. And it's this brush stroke, this very feathery brush stroke he uses that gives us the sense of flickering and motion and dynamism in the painting. Very, very, it's unique to him, that brush stroke. Let's move on towards uh, the end of the book, your discussion of uh, St. Joseph as patron of the Universal Church. W when did this happen and why? Well, he was declared patron of the Universal Church by um, Pope Pius IX, who is, of course, the same pope. Going back to your point, going back to your point of, um, of, of, of Marian contemplation. This is the same Pope who gives us the dogma of the Immaculate Conception and the uh, right. context of the declaration of Joseph as the patron of the universal church is also the fact that the Pope is losing the papal states. So the authority of the Pope out in the world is diminishing every single day. And by 1870, the Pope is in exile within the Vatican walls with absolutely zero temporal temporal authority at all. And so in a certain mm -hmm. sense, as the Pope diminishes, he pushes forward uh, Joseph to be the protector of the church where the papacy at this point is, is literally fighting for survival um, with, with, with very hostile forces that are very happy to say, you know, I don't think the Pope should stay here in Italy at all. The Pope should probably go move to America or go to Germany and, you know, ask the Kaiser for a place to live. So, um, it, it, it is, it is, in, Joseph has been developing all these years, a thousand years he's been developing with all of these different nuances and, and, and influences. And so that at the moment that it seems like the church has been, it, it's been, you know, put against the wall by temporal forces, the Pope, entrusts the church onto Joseph, who is ready to take on the, the challenge. So let's look at this piece by Giuseppe Rollini, Joseph Universal Patron. That work is here in Rome. It's in a church um, right by the train station. And another, another interestingly complicated word to get a picture of. And um, it is, uh, it, it, it's sort of developing the idea of the, what is the iconography of the patron of the universal church? And so, of course, we see Joseph with Jesus. So that, that idea of this, where we used to see, Mary, well, we don't, we still see Mary holding Jesus, but now Joseph also becomes a sort of uh, uh, the, the father and child or the foster father and child. And he's being offered up the image of St. Peter, offered up a, 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 um, um, a model of St. Peter's. So the, the St. Peter's with its tremendous colonnade that opens up and reaches out to embrace the whole world. And so we see Joseph um, looking out and watching over that church. Yeah, well, so there. I, I mean, I hadn't seen most of these depictions before of Saint Joseph as the patron of the church, um, and probably the most striking is the Francesco Grandi um, image. Very powerful, very striking. Um, I'm not sure if I had seen it before, but um, it's it's the, the whole setting. Let's talk about the setting of this. First. So the painting was originally meant to be in. Um, the originally was meant to. It was originally given as a gift for Saint Peter's, and then it was sent up to, um, like Lago di di Gard. It's one of the lakes in the Lake District, and it's um, it, it's a it's such a magnificently monumental painting because you place. Uh, Joseph holding again the Christ child and he's very he's got tremendous gravitas so now this is the this is the Joseph that we um, uh, we would look to as a protector and he looks out on us he's next to he's inside a sort of a Romanesque style triumphal arch and then they have these little curving columns on the sides and the curving columns are always meant to be reminiscent of St. Peter. So again, we have that, that 
like curving column, like the like the columns of the canopy or the baldacchino in St. Peter's Basilica. So these right. curving columns are really meant to evoke St. Peter's, again, the universal church. And he stands on this carpet with these roses strewn at his feet. It's really, it's, um, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful work. Yeah, it looks like somebody who's just been part of a triumphal procession or something. Um, and it's, it's a somewhat forbidding St. Joseph in a way. Formidable. Um, formidable. Yeah, formidable. And uh, yeah, just the whole setting, it's visually unique. And I have a few things that can be said about this. Um, first of all, the, the posture of the Christ child is interesting. How would you, <laughs> very how would you describe what he's doing there? He's, so he's holding on to his father and he's turning and looking away. We've seen him do it with the Madonna a lot of times. And so this is very, he's, he's holding on to almost, almost the way you see him hold on to Mary. And then he looks out towards us. So he's really, he's telling us that, you know, this is the man who will be, who will watch over my people, who will watch over my house. But his expression is almost one of like, I don't know, <laughs> not challenge, but it's it's an interesting expression on the Christ I child. I don't know them, exactly how to describe it. I think both it. of them are serious expressions. So it's not so much of um, it's not an image of um, uh, joyful father and son moment. This is Jesus who is conferring. He's a, he's a baby. He's the Christ child. And yet he's conferring authority on his foster father and his foster father is you know, accepting this responsibility for, you know, he's accepted the responsibility to raise Christ, to take care of Mary. And now for the entire, for, to, to, to look out over the church. And I think it's really also given the circumstances in which this is painted, this is not, um, this is not a moment where the church is sort of sitting on top of the world. And this is a moment where the church mm -hmm. has to face challenges. And I think that, that, that expression is, is one of seriousness. Yeah. I, I can't find exactly the word I want, but it's something like, uh, <laughs> I mean, we have Joseph putting one foot forward. So he's, on this throne, he's standing in front of this throne, but he's putting one foot forward as though, I don't know. He's coming. <laughs> I take you. it as like, yeah. I take it as like a somewhat, a po uh, I take it as like a, a posture that is somewhat dangerous to the world. Like this is the, 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 the combination of the posture and the expression to me communicates uh, a claim reasoning? being made, <laughs> a claim being made on the world and that I'm not just going to stay here on this throne. I am coming out, you know, at a time when Peter is, you know, trapped in the walls of the Vatican. Um, I, I see St. Saint, Saint, Saint Joseph uh, sort of taking a st somewhat, you know, intimidating to the wrong people, step forward. And then Jesus's expression is... Um, Something of a, uh, yeah, it's very, it's very hard to describe exactly what it is, but it's something I of a. I agree entirely about the expression of of Joseph that he is coming out into the world, the Pope is confined within the Vatican. I think it has a sense of, um, uh, this is this is almost like a precursor to the terror of demons, which is his next right. incarnation. I mean, this is a man who he will he'll, he'll do what has to be done. Let's talk qu quickly about um, St. Joseph the Worker, because this is a, an important thing in the era of um, industrialization and the era of the beginnings of Catholic social teaching exactly. with Pope Leo XIII, exactly. and also in the era of the church needing to combat uh, the view of work put forth by communism. communism. Exactly, yes. And Joseph the Worker becomes hugely important. So there's two pieces in particular I'd like to look at because um, they're not only depictions of St. Joseph um, simply going about a task, but they both have an interesting spiritual um, component uh, in different ways. The first one is the Georges de la Tour uh, depiction of St. Joseph the Carpenter, um, which is interesting not only for its for its use of light, but for the particular sort of emotion that that conveys and sort of what it tells us about St. Joseph's life at work. 
So the 17th century, Georges de la Tour uh, comes in the wake of Caravaggio and is very interested in these lighting effects of Caravaggio. And in his work, he tends to create a candle. He was put a candle or some sort of light source and he allows the faces to glow in the light source. And that's what we see St. Joseph perhaps up late completing his orders. But as he's working, he has Christ holding the candle for him, this Christ child. And it really, it, it, it's a... It's a it's beautiful because of the accompaniment to so the, the, the father and son that together in this sort of moment of the, of the uh, 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 intense concentration of his work, yet Joseph is looking up at the child. So even as his hands are busy, his heart, his soul are being filled by the presence of Christ. And granted, this is long before the issues that Leo the Thirteenth will be addressing um, when uh, when he. Uh, when, he, when, he, when, he, when he begins Catholic social teaching and, and, and has to combat the rising menace of um, communism, the utilitarian version, version of the person. And that's something we see um, uh, in, in, in the later in, in, in later image. I think the other image you're talking about is the Fausto Modesti image, which is from uh, the Church of Loreto, the Basilica, the Holy House of Loreto, the Basilica, which was repainted in the late 19th century, has this really wonderful image of Mary and Jesus are on one side of the room and in a room that looks a little bit, has, in a space that looks a little bit chapel-like. It's very comfortable. It's very nice. It's got this high chair. It's all decorated with wood, of course, because Joseph's a woodworker. And Joseph is planing wood on the other side. And as Jesus is speaking to Mary, as they're conversing, Joseph looks up, he's working, and he looks up from his work. And so even as he is involved in his manual labor, his hands are engaged, his, again, his hands are engaged in his task. But again, like Georges de Latour, his heart and his soul and his mind are engaged on the things of the Lord. And it's a very sort of beautiful way of uh, uplifting um, and, and really giving a great dignity, particularly to workers, to operai, as we say in, uh, in, in Italy, manual labors, manual labors who become part, the, the danger of becoming cogs in the machine in the age of industrialization. Yeah, this is one of my favorites in terms of uh, the Modesto Faustini pictures, one of my favorites in, in terms of uh, the uniting action and contemplation, which a lot of these paintings do in one way or another, but this one in, a, in an interesting way. I wanted to ask about the, the painter because I'm not familiar with him, but there's something very medieval to me about this painting. Um, the, about the the space that the figures take up in the background, the w the way the the way the background looks. This there's a certain. It's not that it's totally two dimensional, but there is a certain flatness to it. Um, uh, by comparison, there's a certain sort of like cut out look to the figures. Um, that you see in, say, Fra Angelico. So, um, is there a particular school that this painter is coming yes, from this, that sort of harkens back to that? This is a this is a school. Uh, it's not exactly the Nazarenes as a period known as the Nazarenes, who kind of a retro painters, but it is it is an era um, in the late nineteenth century where we see a kind of uh, retro. Uh, it's not Neo-Raphael, it's not, it's not pre-Raphaelite, but it's the same period as the pre-Raphaelite. So the idea is that kind of looking beyond the worldliness of the Renaissance and moving a little further back into at least the early part of the Renaissance where the spirituality or the serenity of the scene uh, took precedence. I see. Um, so the last uh, piece we'll discuss here is uh, a recent depiction of St. Joseph, a sculpture, uh, which I've seen, um, I don't know if it's the original one, but I've seen it at um, uh, the Catholic Information Center in Washington, DC. Uh, but I don't, okay, yeah, so, so, so I have seen this one in person um, last year and it's by Donny McManus, a good guy, I, I know him. Uh, he's now in uh, Northern Virginia. Um, and, uh, this is a really unique uh, depiction, again, Joseph alone with the Christ child. Um, and it's kind of a combination of this. Uh, he's not at work, but St. Joseph, the worker, is very much there in the depiction. Um, uh, interesting pose, unusual features. 
Um, I, it's not something that I've seen anything like before. <laughs> Jess looks a teeny little bit like Donnie. Um, you know what? I had the same thought yesterday <laughs> when I was looking at this. I yeah. love that work. Um, I, I love that work. I love that Donnie made it. Um, I think it's in many ways, I saw that work many, many years ago, and that's kind of what probably tipped my thinking about St. Joseph in a different direction. The possibility of a Joseph who's seen as um, uh, a young a young man, a, those the, sort of the sinewy arms of a guy who works. I mean, this guy, you can, you can imagine a Joseph today, a guy who goes all day and, you know, works on a construction site. You've got sort of his, his rough clothes and his heavy tools. And yet that same guy that looks very formidable on the site and you wouldn't want to get between him and his hammer, he comes home and just all of this tenderness that is focused on that child and really, and, 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 and the beautiful way that he just seems to be absorbing the presence of the Christ child with all of his senses, the, the closed eyes, the way he just seems to be mm, literally absorbing him through his senses. I, I think it's a, it's a beautiful image to help us start thinking about what does St. Joseph mean to us in 2022 or in the 21st century? And when Pope Francis, who is indeed the, the, the catalyst for this book, he gave us the year of Joseph and he gave us the, 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 the apostolic letter of uh, Patris Corde. And so he really gave us a new, he threw on a platform here, think about Joseph in these ways. And, and there is so much in our, you know, we, 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 we lament the ills of our modern society. So the lack of fatherhood, the, the, the attack on manliness and on men, this sort of this, this continuous subjugation of, or, 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 or terms like toxic max masculinity. So we have a crisis of manhood in this age. We have a crisis of fatherhood. We have crises of employment. We have crises. We have crises of migrations. We have crises um, of all different sorts. And and I think in the pandemic in particular, we have a new type of malaise because we're all, especially here in the first world, we're, we're comfortable. But in our world where we're so used to being able to control, we can fix things with our phone. We can we can do. We're always convinced we can do something. In a world where we're so used to control, it is very very helpful for us to think about a man like Joseph who foster father of Christ, he gets spoken to by angels, and yet he gets battered about by the, by the events of, of, of big government or big tech or big Herod or big whatever without being able to physically change them. But Joseph can't say, oh, yeah, well, I'm going to talk to my foster son. I'm going to show you. Joseph, all he can do is come up with the solutions for his problems. And I think the line that the Holy Father used that I would love to see artists contemplating is creative courage. The way that Joseph confronts the problems that are facing him with an eye on the mission and the creative ways in which he gets from point A to point B, no matter how big and how obstructive and how dangerous and how much more powerful the obstacles may be. And, 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 I, and I, I, I really, I wanted to make a point of closing the book with some of these great contemporary artists so that we would realize this is not a story about a history of something that's long gone. This is a history that brings us into a present. And the Joseph, who is already a patron of the Universal Church and is ready to be our patron, our guide, our leader for all the all the challenges of our ages, our age, and those to come. And you know, uh, Saint Joseph. Also, you mentioned that you know this this could uh, imagery of Saint Joseph could serve to. Um, help counter some of the um crisis in sexual identity that's going on i agree um and and uh you know it, it's interesting because joseph um when i think about joseph a lot i think uh, a lot of the time what comes to mind is um the challenge in accepting um his identity as the the earthly father of god yeah. you know um, and, and the temptation that there must have been to a false humility or to sort of um, running away from that. Mm -hmm. I mean, he had to live with the Holy Family. Mm -hmm. um, he had to live with this exalted role in humility. Um, 
but also not in uh, in the humility of accepting that greatness and and not running away from it and then living day to day with two perfect beings um, and not getting freaked out, you know, not not running away, um, not hiding. And so I think that um, even aside from sort of the more exotic problems that people faced with their sexuality these days, even just for for men and women to sort of accept the greatness that they're given and that this is their given their given identity, their given task, their given calling, and to to be able to accept that because it's simply how things are. It's uh, and and to be able to embrace it. Um, without sort of um with a trust in god's grace to to allow us to fulfill the roles that he's given us exactly. um as men or women i think it's a beautiful uh, i think that way joseph that. is a helpful example in that i think that's another direction and an important direction that we could not only spirituality and hopefully you know with some with me, we have another saint among us who will bring out this idea but we'll also have um, the art. We'll have artists who'll be able to build this out and 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 use it as a source of inspiration. Well, Elizabeth, thank you so much for uh, for coming on the show to discuss your book. It's wonderful. <laughs> Hello thank there. You. This is this is my <laughs> son Joshua, who is wondering why I haven't come to dinner. <laughs> Hello, Joshua. Well, I'll you'll be right there, you'll be with Steve. her. Yes. I'll be right there. All right. Oh, that's nice. Cheerio subito. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Um, that's great. Uh, perfect ending. Um, <laughs> Well, um, I encourage everybody to pick up this book. It's really great. I'm sure it'll be on my best books of the year list at the end of the year. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm sure I'll be diving back into it to take a closer look at some of these images in the future. Honestly, I have to I hate to say it, but it made me wish I was in Italy <laughs> right now. Um, um, but uh yeah, so people uh, who are listening, again, the book is The Silent Night, A History of St. Joseph as Depicted in Art. If you'd like to help us out, uh, help keep the show going, all of our podcasts are listener funded. So please go to catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. We'll be very grateful. We pray for our benefactors every day. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.